Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Relics of Atheline, the Lord Bass masterpiece. And uh, if you remember, like, oh, a year ago or so, I said I was going to read through all these books. I started reading through them, but I never finished it. And it's a huge wall of text, so this video is going to be for everyone who wants to see all of the, uh, the text from the books in this objectives menu <laughs> that I haven't read for a year. So... I'll split the video up and I'll put some chapters down at the bottom if you want to see the different books. I'll go through, I'll find all the, I'll I'll just show the locations where all the books are located on the maps, or at least all the ones I can find, and then we'll read them. So we'll start with Father Garnus's journal. September 19th, AD 1298. A few weeks ago, I returned from the capital together with my newly knighted friend, Sir Emmanuel Fardau, and his companions. After the war ended, we brought with us an ancient artifact that we found on an expedition to the north. It is a magical, dark object called the Relic of the Rock. The monks of Dailijlin Chapel had apparently been looking for it for a very long time, but our Lord Mazenge awarded it to Emmanuel as a prize. Thus, the, the Dailijlin monks will have to travel to my little monastery if they are to study it, if they can drag themselves from their petty little grove. That does remind me, I ought to ask them to bring a few caskets of wine in my invitation letter. The last sentence has been crossed out with a thin line of ink. Despite my best attempts to convince young Emmanuel of the folly of using the evil of magic in the fight for good, he decided to use the relic anyway. He used its dark powers to change the nature of the battlefield. He raised the floor of the lake to create a land bridge, and after marching his troops across it, he managed to defeat the evil rich Zephyra and win back our freedom. The fact that we won, despite using magic for our own ends, leaves me deeply disconcerted. Magic, as I have always heard and read, is a tool of evil, an unnatural force that is not to be touched by humans, lest they start adopting the powers of God and awaken his anger. And yet, here is a case where the supposed forces of good flagrantly use magic for their own purposes, and what did God do to inject his punishment? Nothing at all, it seems. On the contrary, it would seem that the use of magic was the key to our victory against Zephyra, the very thing that gave us back our independence and freed millions from the shackles. Were we not wrong in using magic, then? It goes against everything I have believed and preached for fifty years to say that perhaps we weren't. Perhaps the use of magic can be justified in some rare cases, where when it is used against an even greater evil. This war was, after all, one of self-defense, a war against a tyrant that had committed a great many evils already. Perhaps it would have been a greater evil for us not to use the powers of the relic. If we hadn't, we would essentially have allowed Zephyr's dark reign to continue. But then again, if this is really true, and acts of evil can be seen as relative, what other evil deeds can be seen as good in relation to the alternative? Theft? Murder? War itself? And what then of the seven laws that are the foundation of our dogma? Needless to say, I must study the scriptures very deeply before settling on this issue, but I can say this much already. What has happened in the last few years has certainly got me thinking clearly again. So this is a few months after that, from September to January. January 2nd, AD 1299. Today, I received a reply letter from Father Maxwell in Rockspring. In his latest move, he managed to take out one of my knights. Fortunately, I have a carefully crafted plan that, that should have both his rooks in my hands within three turns. Maxwell also sent me a bottle of what he calls Brightcliff's Finest Single Malt Whiskey with added cocoa flavor. Having taken a few sips already, I can say that it is certainly the best whiskey I've tried from the whole of Rock Spring region. A few months later, March 21st, 1299. Spring's just beginning. It is a sad day in the monastery today. I received another letter from Maxwell today, and in it he managed to foil my plan of relieving him of his second rook. Instead, he blocked my way with a simple pawn, and if I try to kill that pawn, I expose my queen. These are dark times indeed. On the bright side, Maxwell finally managed to get his hands on the book I have been looking for ever since I first lay eyes upon the Relic of the Rock, Tales and Legends of the Sons of Atheline. This is a book that, as far as I know, tells the tale of where the Relic of the Rock comes from, and how it ended up on a tiny island in the mountains in Seracrion. I shall now be using this journal to take notes of interest as I plow through the book. According to the book, the Relic of the Rock is only one of four tremendously powerful artifacts crafted by the old king Atheline. The four together are called the Relics of Atheline, and with their powers combined, one can, allegedly, gain the same power as Atheline himself had. 
It also says the relics were scattered around the world following the fall of the Old Kingdom. A band of priests loyal to Atheline, the sons of Atheline, sons in spirit needless to say, took the relics and hid them throughout the world in the most remote locations they could find. Two were hid far outside the borders of the kingdom, and one was lost, but the relic of the rock was hidden within the borders of the kingdom. The place they chose was a tiny island in the middle of the Winter Mountains, as they were called in those days, a, a place uninhabited since the dawn of time, or at least as far back as the writer of the book could remember. This fits the description of the island we visited very well. Only half the bottle left. God forgive me. Funny enough, it even says that the sons of Athelene put a spell on some giant cats that lived in the mountains and proclaimed them guardians of the relic. Guess they were the same big cats we encountered on our trip there, or descendants of them, or something. Dear lord, this is good whiskey. Forgive for taking thy name in vain, or forgive for taking thy name in vain, lord. So apparently the last survivor of the sons of Athelene is the author of this book, of this here book. Apparently he didn't want his knowledge to die with him, so he wrote down what he knew and then set off to hide the book in a far library, in a far off library. Thing is, the library had been destroyed when the kingdom fell, so he ended up just burying it in the ruin and then dying on the spot. I do wonder who wrote the last part, where the author died, though. Maybe whoever found the book? Oh dear, another bottle gone. Not even a little left for tomorrow morning. Lord Almighty, please forgive this poor soul. And two days later, March 23rd, having sobered up properly now, it took two days for that, uh, I've decided I ought to speak to Emmanuel about this book. He is away on errands with Lord Mazenge at the moment, but hopefully he will have an afternoon to spare once he comes home. I think he needs to know what the Relic of the Rock really is. I have high hopes that he will agree that the Relic needs to be destroyed. It holds powers that are too great for us to play around with. Dark forces that should that should never be unleashed upon the world. If what this book describes is true, then what we did with the land bridge is nothing compared to what this Relic really can do. While I'm at it, I should probably have a good talk with him about settling down with poor Emily. That dear has been unmarried and childless for many years beyond what's fitting now, and I think Emmanuel knows it. To tell the truth, I don't know what's taking them so long. But one should not speculate. I will take it up once he returns home. Until then, I should probably start thinking of my next move. Some way or another, Maxwell is going to get what is coming for him. Alright, so we're given a quest by these monks over here to fetch for them three books. And, uh, Lord Bass did not actually update the, uh, <laughs> the titles of the books from what they were when he was just uh, penciling stuff in his draft. But here's the first one. It's over here in the east part of this map. You pick it up. There you go. One of four books found. Let's read it. Ah, yeah, over here. There we are. It's Garnus's journal. Oh, no. Above it. So this one is a brief history of Gwindelgard. Oh wait, is this the exact one that we had read in the previous, like the Rock Spring Revolution? Uh, no, it's not. It's a different book. Text is different. All right, I'm gonna read this. A brief history of Gwindelgard. In many ways. The founding of Gwindelgard resembles early eras of many other countries that rose from the ashes of the Old Kingdom. Just as in Andoria or Alengard, the land was repopulated after the Day of Raining Rocks by immigrants and former faraway colonists from the Old Kingdom, and a new kingdom slowly emerged. Make sure I'm actually still recording when I alt tab this, I am. What sets Gwindelgard apart, however, is the size of the country and the scale on which the re the remigration and, na and national building had to take place. Alengard, for example, was sparsely populated even in the days of the Old Kingdom due to its mountainous, inhospitable geography, and thus repopulating the country after the fall took nearly a millennium. Andoria, on the other hand, stretches across huge expanses of land, but only parts of them were ever controlled by the Old Kingdom. When the fall happened, the peoples and tribes to the south of the Old Kingdom land could more quickly reoccupy the now desolate north, and the loss of people and civilization was dealt with in a mere two or three centuries. Gwindelgard, which was the heartland of the Old Kingdom, was another story entirely. The country was completely ravaged during the Day of Raining Rocks. All of its cities were razed to the ground, and the population almost entirely exterminated. What had been the center of power in the world now turned into a complete vacuum, a no-man's land. 
Filling these vast lands with people again would take many centuries, and even if humanity was to accomplish it, the balance of power in the world had already shifted and become fully decentralized. After the day of raining rocks, which most historians estimate to have taken place in the 7th century BC, the repopulation of what would become Gwyndelgard started slowly. There were, it is estimated, it is that, ah, there were, it is estimated, only a few thousand survivors from the fall, and only a handful of them survived for more than a few years. Most of them were too choked by the loss of their families, their way of life, their very civilization to continue for much longer. Those who did survive either rebuilt their old homes to the best of their abilities, or abandoned any attempt at rebuilding civilization and ended their lives as primitive hunter-gatherers. It was only a few years later that people started settling among the ruins of the Old Kingdom. First came the former colonists, the people who had lived in the farthest reaches of the Old Kingdom. They returned from their colonial outposts, outposts either to try to rebuild their lost homes, or because they were persecuted by the barbarians in the lands which they had colonized. Then came several tribes of nomads, looking for new lands where they could be free from rivaling tribes, as well as luck seekers from all over the world, adventurous men who wanted a life of complete freedom for them and their families. Then, following the many wars that broke out in the surrounding lands, as there was no longer a central military to keep the primitive tribes in check, there came the larger waves of immigrants. These waves brought thousands of people to the country every year, settling all across the country, building new cities for themselves using the materials left behind, left behind the Old Kingdom. Many also settled alongside the nomadic tribes and former colonists, and mingled heavily with them, forging the, the bonds between peoples that were to become the basis of the new country of Gwyndelgard. There were many waves of immigrants over the next few centuries, and it took until the 3rd century AD for the steady flow of immigrants to stop. By then, the lands of Gwyndelgard were full of people once more, although still nowhere near the 15 to 20 millions that are believed to have lived in just that region in the days of the Old Kingdom. In these days, nobody talked of the region as Gwyndelgard, or as a country at all. At this time, Gwyndelgard was nothing more than an ungovernable mess of tribes and city-states, often at war with one another, and often being harassed by the larger kingdoms and barbarian tribes at its borders. It did, however, have some unifying characteristics. Due to its recent history as a land of freedom and opportunity for those persecuted or oppressed in the rest of the world, there was always a mutual respect for the freedom and self-government of the other tribes. Despite the differences amongst the tribes and city-states, most, most people acknowledge their common background, and their mutual yearning to be left alone and to live in peace. These mutual values and bonds between people of various backgrounds, languages, and cultures were the base upon which the country of Grindelgard was founded in 458 AD. The leaders of each tribe, each city, and each free borough came together to elect a common leader, the lord of the land, who became the ruler of the new country. The lord of the land was to lead the armies of the country to quell infighting between peoples and to defend all members of the federation from external threats. In return, the lord would receive taxes from every part of the country, and his bloodline would continue to rule indefinitely, unless the council of local lords and chieftains were displeased with him, at which point they would elect a new leader. At this stage, Gwyndelgard was a lot smaller than it is today. The region of Roxbring was still largely unpopulated, and the city-state of Pumpkindun had chosen to not join the Federation and would remain independent for another three centuries. The modern capital region was populated by bands of marauding barbarians, attacking both the members of the Gwyndian Federation as well as the country of Zoshi to the west, and Iliengard, the plains at the heart of the country, were only sparsely populated. Still, the founding of this federation was the start of a common history for the peoples of the land, and in time, Gwyndelgard would rise to become a great power in the world once more. The two centuries after the founding were turbulent times. Multiple lines of lords were elected, and then thrown out when they abused their power to take revenge on their old enemies. Several civil wars broke out, as two world lords claimed the title Lord of the Land, and decades of internal strife resulted in thousands of casualties. Nevertheless, Grindelgard eventually emerged a stronger, more unified nation once the warring subsided. In 502 AD, the House of Artican, originally immigrants from Arthelion, became the ruling family of Gwyndelgard. Its first ruler, Ragnai I, was the first lord to take the title King of Gwyndelgard. Ever since then, the ruler of Gwyndelgard holds double titles. He is both the king and sole ruler of the country, as well as the elected lord of all the land. 
To this day, the two titles are used interchangeably here in Brindlegard, while foreigners would be surprised at the lack of hierarchical differences between the two. Following Ragnar's ascendance to the throne, Grindelgard began a long era of internal peace and slow outward expansion. The barbarians of the capital region, then referred to as uh, Avariel region, after the Avariel region, after the lake that separates it from Aliengard, were either pacified, ooh, pacified, or driven away. And Ragnar's successor, Arman, began constructing the new city that would be the capital of the country. All the while, more tribes and boroughs joined the Federation in order to get protection, and the whole region of Antaglion decided to join under Armand's rule, in order to prevent more local wars between them and Gwynhill to their west. Gwyndelgard is known as a rather peaceful country, and it is true that it has seldom gone to war unless having been attacked first, but many of its kings have wanted to change this reputation. King Richard VIII, last of the House of Turan, Wait, is that 7th or 8th? King Richard VII, last of the House of Turan, started three wars of expansion and won them all, a war against Andorra in 997, in which the lands north of Lake Babron were won, against Zoshi in 1003, when a buffer zone of 55 miles was gained west of the capital, and in 1021 against Seracrion, when the provinces of Northend and Perdigia, lost to Seracrion after they attacked in 1018, were regained. It was Richard VII who gave Grindelgard its modern borders, and since his day, Grindelgard has not once been to war with an outer enemy, a period of peace not seen since the days of the Old Kingdom. As we can see, Grindelgard has managed to regain much of the Old Kingdom's glory, and stands today as the worthy successor to this great civilization. Our neighbors in Zoshi may have preserved a mutated form of the Old Kingdom's language, their Tylish, literally the tongue, but we have we cooped the soul of their civilization, the ability to enforce peace and let freedom and human development flourish. Now the next book is up here on this mountain, just to the side of these monks here. Pick it up, two or four books found. And this one is Idiot Architects of the Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom is a fascinating part of our history, but it's also one shrouded in mystery. Historians say that the Old Kingdom was more technologically advanced than today's society in many ways, but what if they are wrong? What if the architects of the Old Kingdom were actually complete morons? New evidence shows us that this really was the case. Archaeologists in the south of Gwyndelgard have recently discovered copies of blueprints, allegedly of a strange type of windmill that was common in the cities of the Old Kingdom. What's strange about this particular windmill is that it doesn't mill anything. It is no milling wheel, and would have been completely useless to a miller. It's clear that only an idiot of, of an ar only an idiot of an architect could dream up such a ridiculous invention. But this is not the end of it. Find out the most shockingly stupid part of this structure on the next page. You there, yes you. Do you need to cross a stream or make a new way across a roaring river? If so, then we can help you with that. At Dirty Daryl's Bridge Building Company, you get good quality bridges and jetties at low prices, no matter where in the country you are. Send a messenger pigeon to Dirty Daryl's Bridge Building Company, Capital Road, North 3B, Capital Zoshi, and we, we will get you that bridge in less than two years. We guarantee it. Dirty Daryl's Bridge Building Company does not guarantee that the bridge will actually be complete in two years. The architects of the Old Kingdom were not just stupid, creating a windmill that doesn't mill anything. There is one more detail that will forever change your image of the so-called geniuses of the ancient world. Instead of being uh, attached to a milling wheel, the wings of the mill seem to have been connected to a box-shaped structure on the floor of the mill, which in turn was connected to an adjacent building by a set of threads. What were they trying to accomplish here? To tear the other building apart in the least effective way imaginable? We thus have conclusive evidence that the architects of the Old Kingdom were not just impractical when demolishing houses, but also terrible at virtually everything. That's all for this month, but don't miss the next issue of The World. Fascinating. And now the final book is over here, on the west side of the map. Pick it up, pick it up. That should be all the books. Time to return to the library. And let's see what this book is. Those idiot architects, we read that. 
The Rise of Zephyr, a brief overview. Say the name Zephyr to any man, woman, or child in Zoshi, and you can see their eyes light up with a sense of pride and joy. Our great Queen Zephyr is seen by most as the greatest ruler Zoshi has had in modern times, possibly of all time. She is the first ruling queen in our long line of monarchs, and she ruled from 1285 until just last year, 1298. She is, in many ways, the embodiment of Zoshin greatness. But that was not always the case, far from it. Just like our country did under her rule, Zephira came from humble beginnings and rose to the top through will and hard labor. Her life story is an inspirational tale, a tale that will be passed down through generations and inspire countless men and women to struggle for greatness. Yet, the story of Zephyr, before the rise to power as a warlord, is shrouded in mystery, and the stories from these days are more fiction than fact. Who is Zephyr, really? That is what this book will explore. Zephyr was born in Vixen Hall in 1261, the only child of a cooper. As her father never got any sons, she was trained to take over his trade when he grew too old. Zephyr, however, was much more interested in the art of magic than in the art of barrel making. From an early age, she discovered that she had the power to make objects around her bow to her will through thought alone. She could make the water in the stream swirl around and change its flow, if only briefly. She could control the branches of a tree to give her more shade where she was lying on the ground, and much more. At first, at, at first she thought little about what her skills could be... Could be at first, she thought little about what use her skills could be of, and used them for her own amusement alone, as children do. As she grew older, and as she kept training, she started to realize the full extent of her powers. As a young adult, when her emotions burst out, so did her powers, wreaking havoc on the town of Vixen Hall. When she was filled with rage or sadness, her powers could set fire to the buildings and trees around her. In one such tragic instance, her powers set fire to her father's workshop while he was still inside. Panicking, unable to focus her will on putting out the fire, Zephyr could do nothing to save him. At this young age, Zephyr realized that she had to take control of her powers and make them bow to her will, rather than her emotions and outbursts. She forced herself not to shed another tear, turning her grief and anger into willpower. At age 14, Zephyr left Vixen Hall, or what was left of it, for good. She wandered the vast lands of Zoshi and Gwindelgard, who at the time were still allies, and developed and mastered her powers throughout her journey. No one, except Zephyr herself, really knows what happened on this journey. There are a lot of stories from around the country of a wandering witch that came to town, exposed her powers, and was thrown out. But one can assume that most of these are made up to tie certain meaningless villages to the glory and fame of Zephyr. We do, however, know for certain that she spent a year in a monastery in northern Gwindelgard, learning to read and write, and scavenging the monastery's books for information about magic. As the monks at this record kept detail, the monks, as the monks at this monastery kept detailed records of who passes through their doors, or keep detailed records of who passes through their doors, we know that Zephyr was here from April eleventh, twelve seventy eight, to February nineteenth, the following year, allegedly. This is where she came across the legend of the relics of Atheline, four artifacts handed down by the legendary king Atheline with immense magical powers bound to them. If you had the relics under your control, you could shape the world as you saw fit, and control the minds of men through your thoughts. It was in these ancient books that she found the man who would inspire her for the rest of her life, Atheline. He had powers beyond her wildest dreams, and he built up an empire that controlled the world for a millennium. The world was at his mercy. But, if I am allowed to make some assumptions, what inspired her was not so much his power per se, but how complete he was as a man. Atheline controlled not only himself through his sheer will, which in turn is a great achievement, but the entire world. He taught himself to conquer all urges and bursts of emotion inside himself, and used his powers to shape the world around him. In Atheline, Zephyr saw the perfection of man, a man driven by his own will alone, not bound by the desires and emotions that kept others from reaching greatness. Whether or not Atheline ever actually existed was of little importance. Even if he was just a concept, it was still a great source of inspiration. Just like Atheline took his people and led them to greatness, so she wanted to take her people and make them a greater nation, make them rulers of the world. Aged only 19, she traveled eastern Zoshi, inspiring people with her visions for the future, her great powers, and her determination. By the time the Civil War broke out in 1282, she had already gathered a large following. Her numbers grew for every passing day. 
and after two years of struggle, she had all of Eastern Zoshi under her control. When, ta- when Count Tangle, the strongest warlord of the West, joined her side, the war was essentially over. The other warlords, who had hoped for Zephyr and Tangle to slug it out against one another, now resigned and marched home with their armies. Zephyr rode into the capital victorious, relieving the old king, Iphorus, of his duties. That, dear reader, is the story of how Zephyr went from a cooper's daughter to queen of Zoshi, aged only 24. Truly, she is the greatest ruler we have ever had. And that book, of course, is right next to the tourist guide. <laughs> this, folks, is the house where our, our great Queen Zephyr grew up and started learning the arts of magic. Of course, it's just a ruin now, as with the rest of the village, because Zephyr tested her powers on all the houses. And then, finally, there's one last book in this scenario, as we come up here into the city. Books 4 of 4. Cataphracts, and read that book. What is this? Uh, A Traveler's Guide to Argantonia To claim that one can do the nation of Argantonia justice by talking of it in a pamphlet of such measly thickness would be idiocy and dishonesty. The largest and, by some definitions, most ancient of the world's nations still in existence cannot be given a worthy description on just a few pages, yet I will do my utmost to provide you with a true in an overarching sense image of this vast, exotic, and fascinating place. Argantonia stretches from the western banks of the river Concardia and thousands of miles into the west. If you were to imagine its size, then ponder traveling from the country's easternmost border up and down all the hills and dales of Zoshi, across the muddy plains and dense forests of Gwindelgard, and to the edge of the tree-covered mountains of Alengard, where the sea ends the world now. Know that you were to travel the same distance but westward. You would still have 150 miles to go before reaching the westernmost tip of Argantonia. Should you decide to enter Argantonia on your journey after all, you would find that it offers lush and various landscapes, filled to the brim with devious valleys, dark forests of exotic trees, and river upon river upon river, slowly making their way from the Gilhin Mountains to the ocean. The easternmost quintile of the nation, as well as large swaths of its southern border, is densely populated and covered in a patchwork of farmland and canals. The canals, you will find, are almost as numerous as the roads here, a feature unique to this part of the country. Here you can stare in wonder and amazement as the people of the canals bring their goods from harbor to harbor, trading and bargaining with one another. These canals are the economic veins of the country, as well as a largely used basis for transportation. Horses are a rarity here, and instead every man of some wealth has a boat. It is the custom that every boy at the age of five starts building a boat for himself, under the watchful gaze and guidance of the protecting father. This tradition, however, is only an adaptation of the traditions of the jungle tribes further to the west, where the rafts and boats are used every day to travel along the wide, slow-moving rivers of the Great Inland. This, rather fittingly, brings us to the history of the country and its unique foundations. The Argantonia we know today was once three very distinct cultures who were blended slowly into a single mass through the mold of time. The jungles were even more expansive in those days, roughly 600 BC, reaching just shy of the modern border of Argantonia and Zoshi. Here, at the edge of the jungle, the Old Kingdom was building its outposts, cutting roads through the jungle in an attempt to spread civilization into the wild, untamed, and unexplored west. On the day of raining rocks, when the Old Kingdom was wiped out through some unknown act of magical farce, or of magical force, many of the outposts west of the river crumbled to dust. The jungle cities, on the other hand, survived, largely unscathed. With supply lines from the east cut, however, these jungle colonies either turned into self-governing town-states, or the people migrated back to the east, only to fall prey to jungle diseases on the way, and ultimately find their homes and families gone. Here, at the border of civilization and the wild, the old pioneers settled and formed a new country. They mingled heavily with the tribes from the far south, who had been brought north by promises of wealth, peace, and freedom and in the centuries to come, they became a a culture of their own. Once a formal ruling class was established in 250 BC, the old settlers were gathered under the new country of Yubata, a mongrel of a nation with ancient, crumbling palaces of brick and rock, and town and cities made out of clay and wood. 
While the country of Yubata evolved to the east, the old outposts of the old kingdom in the deep jungle sent expeditions further west, coming into contact with the vast barbarian nations of raft sailors, tree climbers, and ape eaters that populated the banks of the mighty jungle rivers. Once the warrior chieftains found out about the great wealth and poor defenses of the cities to the east, the outposts were overrun, and the population either exterminated or turned into a class of scholar slaves due to their immensely greater knowledge of science, technology, and warfare. Over the course of seven centuries, the old primitive jungle tribes evolved into a largely civilized, non-nomadic kingdom, with leaders emulating the pomp, style, and splendor of the old kingdom, almost, some would say, a parody of what the Old Kingdom stood for. It devoured its neighboring primitive tribes, created a civilized, oh, wildling hybrid of a civilization that went largely unnoticed in the East, unnoticed everywhere except for in Yubata. Knowledge of this powerful kingdom reached the Yubatan leaders by word from their own explorers, who reported about vast cities built upon the dense uh, canopy of the trees. Soon, many local chieftains sent their men to raid aid their neighbor to the east. The Yabatans, not wanting to risk a full-scale war, responded by building a large wall as the borderlands of the jungle uh, a large wall as the borderlands of the jungle and the kingdom. This wall was of little help, however, when the people of the forest invaded Yabata in large numbers ten years later. The Yabatans had gravely underestimated the war-making knowledge of the jungle tribes, who brought huge siege weapons to the scene, which they had learned to build from the scholars of the old kingdom. The Yabatans managed to stave off the worst part of the attacks, ending the war in a bloody stalemate after three years of fighting. After the war, both sides were badly bloodied and the majority of their armies were crushed, but through a cunning plan, the forest tribes convinced the Yabatans to sign a peace treaty clearly in the tribe's favor. The tribes tricked Yabatan spies into believing two more armies were on their way through the jungle, forcing the Yabatans into accepting the best terms they could get. The tribesmen would receive some Yabatan land, including the Great Wall, and would be allowed to settle in Yabatan cities. Yabata, in effect, would become a grand province of the jungle kingdom. The Yabatans accepted, however reluctantly, and that was the end of Yabata as a free country. They were, however, not turned into a lower class like the people of the Old Kingdom had once been, partly because the jungle tribes had become too civilized to allow such treatment of their enemies, and partly because the Yabatans were far too numerous and powerful to be treated in such a way. Over the course of several hundred years, the two countries merged into one. It took several civil wars and struggles for the throne, but the nation did eventually mold into one. In the 10th century, in the midst of a large inter internal war for the throne, Lord Aluyamane, Aluyama, Lord Aluyama, a nobleman from Old Yabata, was running away with a small force into the western extremity of the jungle, into previously uncharted territory lands, that, into previously uncharted territory, lands that even the jungle tribes had never explored. As the jungle began to clear, he was greeted by a stunning vision. As he was looking at mountain ranges surrounded by fire-scathed plains and covered in stone buildings of various sizes, what he discovered was an ancient civilization. Previously unknown to most of the world, and only known in obscure legend among the barbarians of the extreme west as the Atlean civilization, the people from the edge of the world. Alu Aluyame was deeply fascinated with the Atlean civilization, which was highly evolved but different from any other culture in the world. Their buildings were both simplistic in their design, yet extremely ornate in their decoration, often depicting the thousands of gods that the Atlians worshipped. But, as he soon realized, they were not a very powerful civilization. According to local scholars, the nation had once ruled the oceans of the west, reaching distant islands and archipelagos inhabited by great lizards and men with greenish skin, but they rarely ventured into the deep jungles of the east, very rarely coming into contact with the, as we would call it, known world. For several hundred years, however, their civilization had dwindled, contact had been lost with the faraway colonies, and the remaining Atlians were left in their grand cities on the mountainsides, becoming more and more isolated. Aluyame, however, arrived at a crucial time. The Atlian people were, were in an uproar due to bad harvests and weak leadership from their senators, and despite their gloomy worldview, many people longed for a brighter future. Aluyame, through interpretation, told them of the world that lay to the east, and how they would claim a strong position in it by joining him. The Atlians eventually accepted the proposition and rallied under his banner. 
Five years after disappearing into uncharted territory, Aliyah May returned to the war-torn lands of Argant- Argantinia with an army of Atlians, Yabatans, and junglemen left behind him. And junglemen behind him. Uh, after another year of fighting, the other throne pretenders were defeated and Aluyume could claim the throne. With Aluyume, the hegemony of Yabatans and Atlians of the jungle was first established. It has remained a benevolent hegemony until this day. All three people largely rule their own lands, and the junglemen, due to their great numbers and internal rivalry, have never again joined together like they did when invading Yabata. While the Atlians and Yabatans retain strong regional coherence, allowing them to balance the power that junglemen otherwise would have. The ruling class has consisted since these, these days of three quarters Yabatans and Atlians, despite the two making up less than half of the country's population. It's estimated that the Yabatans are 35% of the population, the Atlians 10%, and the junglemen 55%. The junglemen, however, are also much more spread out across the giant inland jungle. There has been plenty of turmoil in Argentonia since then, too. Even though revolutions and, success- and succession wars have become far less frequent in the last few centuries, because of these internal struggles, Argentonian leaders rarely have gone to war against external foes. Only in the last few decades have there been a few standoffs with Zoshi, all started and won by that country. The rulers may want to strike back hard, but rallying men from so many different cultures has proven very hard. Through two millennia of interchanging times of conflict, peace, and prosperity, Argentonia has accumulated a very rich and very varied fortune in architecture. The most spectacular sites, which all travelers should attempt to visit, are the five palaces of Argentonia. The enormous creations represent all the stages of, of Argentonia's history. There is the Palace of Agunder, a magnificent relic of the Old Kingdom, now in the center of the jungle city of Tixi Agamale. There is the Castle of the Twin-Headed Eagle, built by the jungleman after a century of studying the architecture of the Old Kingdom. There is the Palace of Tekushu, Tekushu, Tekushu. There is the Palace of Tekushu, the capital of both ancient Yabata and the seat of the present Lord of Argentonia. There is the mountain stronghold of Li. Koyan, the most siege-proof castle in the world, and then there is the most fascinating and magnificent of them all, Tolor Magistia, the stronghold of the Atlian city of, of Tigubo, situated since time Im- immemorable on the brim of a dormant volcano, looking down into a river of burning rock flowing thousands of feet below. A short pamphlet like this can only begin to describe this huge exotic nation. I can only hope that my dabble into the culture, founding, and evolution of Argentonia has sparked your interest and made you consider discovering the country yourself. And this is bleeding into the Gwindle God book as the objectives have consumed themselves. Now on to the second scenario. The first book is right here near the start. Just kill these guards there and send Emmanuel over to pick up this book all right the miners journal tough shift today turns out the wall was two meters thicker than we thought had to go at it with a pickaxe when the mechanical drill broke down strange thing about that we had repaired it twice this week already Yesco changed the bolts on the main drill axis just yesterday, but this morning they had rusted shut and the drill would not rotate. Probably something in the air, I think. It has a weird smell to it. Can't be poisonous or flammable since we've had no deaths or fires since we got down here, but it's corroding the metal in the drills. Anyway, broke through the wall at six. At six, said the clock. I hope the union doesn't mind. Couldn't end the day without finishing what we started. Yesco and the other promised not to tell the chief once we got back out. Easy shift. Spent all day clearing the rubble from the entrance. Turns out there's a big opening ahead. Looks like a 10, 15 feet, looks like a 10, 15 feet to the roof. Shout, uh, sent out Yeshko and Iantis to scout ahead. See where to drill next. If this cave goes deep enough, we will be a few days ahead of schedule. Then we can take a few days to smoothen out the walls of the tunnel before they bring down the construction workers. Strange things been happening today. Yesko and Iantis didn't show up, and when we went deeper in to search for them, we heard strange noises in the walls. Voices, perhaps, or animal noises. Nothing should be able to live down here, but it almost seems like... Uh, like, like what? Like what? Alright, yesterday we were attacked. 
I was writing this journal when it happened. Oh, you didn't finish your sentence. Uh, first, Yeshko came running to the camp, all bloody and limping, said he was being chased by demons. Moments later, a bunch of them foul creatures came through the tunnel entrance. They looked like humans, but bulkier, with the color of granite and no hair on their filthy bodies. The most terrifying part of them is their face. They have no lips, and their huge mouths are like black voids, surrounded by spike-shaped teeth. They attacked us in large numbers. Several men were killed. Yeshko, Dylan, uh, Temish. Antis died down in the dark. I only got away with a few scratches. The demons appear to be very afraid of fire, so we've put up torches all around the camp and lit an extra fire by the entrance. Now we only hope they uh, stay away, at least until my shift ends. Right. And these books, they they seem to overwrite some of the text if I pick up all of them at once, so I'm just going to pick them up one at a time, and I'll read all four of them. All right, book number two is in the middle of the cave, guarded by a few of these demons. Go pick it up. Oh, there's more spawning. We'll, we'll, we'll read it while they're chasing us. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll kill them first. Now we'll read it. Uh, living underground. Where do we come from? What is the meaning of life? Why do we not live underground like the far more fascinating moles do? No one goes through their life without asking themselves these questions at least once. Now, theology and religion present their answers to the first two questions, but only science can answer the third one. And the answer is, well, now we can. For centuries, our civilization has conquered large parts of the world, and we now inhabit places never before thought possible. There are crowned cities in the tallest mountains and the deepest jungles, and there are even some who suggest a city could be built upon a floating, man-made island. And now, the time has come for us to conquer the dark world below. For ten years, a band of miners, geologists, and city-building enthusiasts have been digging their way towards the center of the world. If what they say is true, and there are decent living conditions below, a new crown city is likely to be built deep underground with Atheline's direct help. From this new city, new expeditions will be sent to dig their way further down. The long-term goal of this band of enthusiasts is to find a way to the very core of the world, and be the first to enter the fabled inner heaven of the world. Many people have never heard of the inner heaven, and it is indeed little more than a legend, but new findings from the research teams below show that it might be very real. Indeed. Show that it might be very real indeed. Researchers have found, for example, a natural light source that shines during the day, and which gets stronger the deeper you go. At the center of the world, they believe the light is permanent, and where there is light, there is life. At the center of the world... We may be able to find a new dwelling place, safe from storms and pesky bad weather, for those willing to abandon their own lives. Who knows, in the future, we might all be living there, at the heart of the world, and the world above will be nothing more than farmland, supplying us with whatever we cannot get on our own down there. Uh, one day, perhaps, we will, be, we'll, we will be a more fascinating species than the moles. Okay, now this one is where things get interesting. Now, what is this place, Manuel? So let's show you how this works. We have these four relics here. Each of them has a letter as their name. And there are these four tiles in the ground. The road, the broken road, the fungus road, and the snow. If we look throughout the cave, there's going to be these pedestals with books. If we walk our heroes past those pedestals, we'll get a chat message that says a letter. So let's show where all of them are. There's the road terrain over here. The road fungus here, the broken road here, and then the snow over here. Now, each of those letters will correspond to the name of the relic, and you have to put the relic on the corresponding tile. So if I check my notes real quick, we have R goes on the road, E that goes on the road fungus, A goes on the broken road, and L goes on the snow. We get a message, the gate has been opened. And now we can pass through this gate up here. So let's head over there. Oh, chasing us. Okay, we'll activate a torch. Pass through the gate. It doesn't open, we just pass through it. Whoa, this cave goes even deeper. I wonder what's down there. And we get to this room with floating statues and a book. 
So let me turn the cave noises off and we'll read it. And this book is The Art of Magic, Volume 1. In this book, you will learn the foundations of the craft of wizardry, the science of spell, and the history of witches and warlocks, or, in short, the art of magic, from the words of a true master. You will also have the scales lifted from your eyes and learn what magic is not, and what magic never will be, what is truth, and what is the stuff of myth and fairy tales. Magic and spell, witches and warlocks, are popular themes and archetypes in folk tales, plays, and fine literature. In our culture, the wizard is the mysterious guardian of great knowledge that arms the hero with wisdom and powers beyond his natural grasp, paralyzing spells, mystical swords, and potions. The wizard is the master of supernatural powers and, in effect, not entirely human as opposed to the hero, but a half-god. He is perceived as something slightly alien, beyond, and sometimes above, the ordinary human. And yet, while wizards are indeed different from the humans, the notion that he is a god, wielder of infinite powers that bend willingly to his wishes, is not an accurate description by any means. Other cultures perceive the wizards and the powers he possesses in very different ways. The jungle tribes of Argentonia believe, for instance, that magic is a force of nature, and they believe in gods and the shapes of trees, monkeys, and other strange creatures. To them, a wizard is a man with the ability to speak with the forces of nature and persuade them to do his bidding. This interpretation, is, too, this interpretation too, is far from the truth. While we might consider their view of magic to be strange and wrong, and they, likewise, see ours the same way, both serve the purpose of explaining the force of magic to the uninitiated layman. The true nature of magic, however, is a different story. In truth, magic is not a power bestowed upon unwitting men, chosen at their conception by some higher power, nor is it a wild force of nature to be tamed. You might even say that there is nothing truly magical about magic, for magic is the power of man. Magic, in essence, is will, pure and undiluted. In every population, you will find power. You, in every population, you will find people with varying amounts of willpower. Some have very little of it, or squander it on superfluous activities. Some have a lot of it, and some have the ability to use their willpower to, to directly influence the world around them, and not just in their minds, not by physical action, coercion, or argumentation, but by will alone, by magic. These few, lucky or select, depending on your personal belief are the crop from which powerful wizards and witches are drawn. For one is born with full control over their will. Uh, for no one is born with full control over their will. Even those lucky few must spend years and years practicing their skills, taming their will and in turn their bodies, and then, once they are prepared, the world around them. Like any skill set, magic power doesn't come fully formed to any individual. Even those with the greatest talent and potential must practice their skills relentlessly. Though the realization that magic, through the realization that magic is willpower, one myth, particularly prevalent in fairy tales and fiction, that can be dispelled is that a magician's powers are infinite. Often in the stories you will be told of wizards who, with no seeming difficulty, hold wild animals under their control for scores of years, or bewitch entire cities and turn them into dark hellholes by implementing some form of magical automation. This is pure storytelling nonsense. Because magic is will, it is a mental resource that one can run out of, and will do so every day. Increasing the size of this resource pool is arduous labor, and it is much harder to automate magical routines than it is to automate simple everyday routines. Increasing your pool of willpower is difficult, and takes months, years, and even decades of practice, even if you possess no magical power at all. For a magician, it is doubly difficult, as he or she must economize with a limited pool of willpower between both magical activities and other regular activities. For, you see, the willpower used for manual labor and the willpower used for magic draws from the same source. What separates a wizard from the everyman is that he is yet another outflow from the pool. It appears, however, that people with magical powers have one advantage. The maximum size of their pool of will is often far greater than that of every man meaning that they can, with a lot of practice, spend as much, as much willpower of everyday activities as the everyman, and still have will left for magic. Some magicians even reach monumental levels of willpower, and although they are very few, these actually start to reach the levels described in fairy tales and fiction. 
The most famous and most prominent of these rare magicians, of course, is Atheline, to whom we will dedicate the next volume of the series. Right, and we can leave the cave and head back up to rejoin everyone and leave. And the final book is just after the mini boss fight with Zephyr. It is down over here, heading backwards towards the city. Let's pick it up. There we are, book four. Uh, there's no title for it, I guess. Other than it does have Song of the Void down there later. Come, join us far below. Come, join us in paradise. Come to us at the heart of the world, where we dance day and night, where the light of the world above can never reach. Come, we will show you the way. Hasten and leave the foul world behind. He felt as if, as if the spirits were literally filling him up inside. The air he breathed smelled purer somehow, and the fatigue was quickly leaving him. When he stood up, he saw another tunnel entrance at the back of the cavern, lit up by the cold light of the spirits and he took up his bag and walked into it. The spirits guided him deeper and deeper into the dark, their shrill, angelic voices calling for him. Their light guided him down treacherous ravines, across dark gorges, and through narrow passageways, not even a meter across, where he had to empty his lungs in order to fit through. Down, down, down he went, and the spirits sang louder and danced brighter the deeper, uh, the deeper he got. His hands were scraped and his legs were scratched from the climb and the occasional fall, but he could hardly feel the pain any longer. He was getting closer now. He could feel it. As night turned into day, the moon far above him turned away, and the spirits, who had danced to try to reach for it, began to fade away. The natural light they shone, they shone with was dying out, and the fatigue and the pain were slowly returning to him. He fell to the floor from exhaustion, and he cried out to the spirits, Don't leave me here. Soon the natural light was gone, and the darkness once more engulfed him where he lay. The spirits were gone, and so were the powers they had lent him. He was hungry, and his hands and legs screamed in pain. The only thing that remained was the song of the spirits. But it too was changing. It became darker, more guttural, and more aggressive. It was the roaring growl of a strange beast now, rather than the song of an angel. He struggled to imagine how he had ever found it beautiful. As he lay there, shivering on the cold stone floor, the growling turned into roars and barking, and it surrounded him on all sides, huge claws scraping against the rocks. Something was coming towards him. He could feel the ground shaking lightly. Thud, 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 thud. Song of the Void It was on his 940th day, that's a lot of days, in Elberon, that he realized he couldn't remember the sun. He recalled what it was, a flaming ball hanging in the sky, but no images appeared in his mind when he thought about it. He wondered how long it had been since he thought about the world above, and he came to the conclusion that the question didn't deserve the time spent looking for an answer. The world above meant nothing anymore. The city of Elberon, likewise, was no home to him anymore. The so-called light in the dark was a cancerous tumor infecting the perfect darkness of this world. When he walked the streets of the city, he could see the thousands of burning fires that lit it up by night, and he could feel the horrible heat they spread. At first, he had started to put out the fires, one by one, when no one was watching, but the light guards soon caught him. When he tried to explain what an abomination the presence of the fire was to this world, they wrote him off as mad. He spent a few nights in jail, tortured by the ever-present light from the torches outside his cell, and was then released without much discussion. The prison guards, in between their laughter, said they hoped he had learned his lesson. He had. He knew now that he stood no chance against the light on his own, but he also knew there was a reason why only he saw the light as evil. The darkness was not calling for him to put out the fire, it would find its own way of dealing with it in due time. It was calling him to come and join it, to become a part of it. It wanted him to go deeper into the ground, deeper than any man had gone before, and he gladly accepted the offer. For two months he had been preparing for the journey, accumulating clean water, food, and tools, and each day swimming out into the lake by the city's edge, up into a dark tunnel to scout ahead. Something inside him told him this was the way he was supposed to go. When the final day came, he packed everything he needed in a large bag of thick ox skin to protect it from water, and swam out into the lake and up the tunnel. 
After swimming a full kilometer upstream, he came upon a small cavern, a natural chamber with a dirt floor where he laid down to rest. Exhausted from the journey, he ended up spending the night there, and that was when he first saw the vision. Out of the compact darkness came spirits of cold, white light, the natural light of this world. They surrounded him, half-blinded him, and he felt his heart race. They clung to the roof of the cavern and danced around the stalactites, and they sang a song to him, a low, murmuring song. Uh, like the song of a distant angel. Angel. His eyes were filled with tears. His heart filled with joy. I think this is probably out of order. Come, join us far below. Come, join us in paradise. Yeah. That, uh... This story is backwards in the objectives. Oh, well. <laughs> And the next book is in the next scenario. It's hard to miss. It is right here. Right before we go to the leaders and talk to the states master in Yellow Side. At the Yellow Side Parliament. It is the Great Island of Yellow Side. The island of Yellow Side is a very isolationist region where the people don't care much about what's going on in the rest of the world as long as the world keeps trading through their harbor. The Yelanese have always been a very independent people, and even under Amerian rule, they have managed to retain much of their sovereignty. They still have a publicly elected leader, the so-called Statesmaster, just as they have had for hundreds of years. Nowadays, however, the Statesmaster ranks below the governor, which is chosen by the King of Amaria. Yellowside started out as a very poor country. It was colonized sometime in the 7th century BC by people from what is now Arth Arthelian. They left their homeland because of poverty, droughts, and failed harvests, and found shelter on an island with plenty of rain and a sea full of fish, but little land to grow crops on. The Yelanese keep largely to themselves, and the countries around the inner sea left them alone as well. They saw no use in a rocky island in the middle of the sea. This might seem odd, as you could say it would have been a perfect location for a naval base for a growing kingdom that wanted to control the seas, but this is not very strange after all. One must remember that very few military ships at this time were able to sail across the open sea. They always stayed close to the shoreline. When ships eventually emerged that could sail on open seas, Yellowside started to become a more important place. By this time, in the 6th century AD, Yellowside had grown a sizable population, and its main harbor was starting to be used to house visiting trading ships heading from one side of the inner sea to the other. Soon, merchants on both sides realized they would save time and money if they brought their goods to Yellowside and traded there instead, and thus began the era of Yellowside as an unlikely great power. The taxes levied on foreign merchants were comparatively low, drawing merchants to the island from trade centers nearby with much higher tariffs and taxes. The early states masters of this era, era proposed, proposed leaving, levying taxes on foreign merchants. The early states masters of this era proposed levying taxes taxes on foreign merchants, and using the surplus to lower taxes on the Yelanese population. Because the taxes were comparatively low for the merchants, they still profited from coming to the island, and the tax burden of the islanders were continuously, was continuously lightened, allowing them to use their own gains to buy material and resources from the foreign merchants and build up a flourishing economy. Because of the success of this system, almost all states masters up until the 8th century continued on this path, and Yellowside continued to prosper. In 752 AD, the growth of trade had begun to slow down. Many traders from the outskirts of the continent sailed for months to get to the inner sea, but stopped to trade at the Straits of Azul instead of taking the longer route into the inner sea itself. The states master at the time, Ulzarek VI, decided to use this development to Yellowside's advantage. He sent a fleet and army to the newly established trade centers and seized them through as little bloodshed as possible. The merchants here were allowed to keep trading as they used to, and the people were allowed to follow their own laws, provided Yellowside get a share of the revenue from the trade, and were allowed to turn the trading posts into fortified bastions. In this way, the Yelanese kept both the trade in the inner sea and gained even more money from the trade in the south. However, it wasn't until after Ul Zarek VI's death in 755 that Yellowside truly became a great power other than economically. The new statesmaster, 
Elyric II deviated from the path of his predecessors and raised taxes on his own people, albeit slowly, to afford an expanded army and enormous navy. This was a very unpopular move at first, but because it had only a limited negative impact on the economy of the island, his successors kept growing, going down this path after he was thrown out of office in 761. Yellow Side now grew into a true great power, defending its trading privileges uh, defending its trading privileges through military intervention against its rivals. For over a hundred years, Yellowside dominated the inner sea, both through trade and raw force. When these city-states in the west grew and became realistic threats to their dominance, the states masters played them against one another and kept them down. Throughout the so-called Hundred Years of Greatness, the state grew exponentially. The military, of course, grew massively, but other areas as well, to appease the public, who weren't all too happy with having to pay for the armies and navies of the new regime, a system of people's rewards was instituted, giving out money to people for doing good deeds, taking care of the sick, taking care of one's children, having extra children, voting in elections, and, in the end, even for being a Yelanese citizen at all. The system was held together for 70 years by the still strong work, working moral of the Yelanese, as well as the trade incomes, but as tariffs rose and net contrib contributors to the system became fewer and fewer, the system collapsed completely in 851. The system of people's rewards was removed completely by the new states master, Urgazikl I, and the army and navy were greatly decimated. Large chunks of the population were enraged, either by the loss of their entitlements or the reduction of the armed forces that made Yellowside the greatest power on the planet, and the country was on the brink of revolution. The collapse of Yellowside would have been a bloody turmoil if it wasn't for another disaster that happened at the same time. As Yellowside had grown weaker and weaker due to its faulty economics, the city-states in the south, along the Straits of Azul, had been fighting a brutal war for total domination of the region. In 844, the kingdom of Amaria emerged victorious, uniting the region under one ruler. In 849, the Amarians besieged and seized the Yelanese trading posts all around the straits. The Yelanese navy tried to intervene, but they were repelled after several large naval battles. With the navy demolished when the economic collapse hit Yellowside two years later, the island was badly defended, giving the Amarians a perfect opportunity to invade the homeland of their old masters. The island was invaded from every side, and the quarreling Yelanese were forced to redirect their anger in fighting towards an external enemy. The invasion of the island became a long-winded war, and in search for hope of the Yelanese gathered around their oldest traditions and way of life, their stubbornness, their independence, and their hard work ethic, while which translated into never giving up the fight against the Amarians. After a year of war, the island was at last in Amarian hands, but because they only won a narrow victory and didn't want any future wars, the Amarians agreed to give the islanders some of their old freedom in return for overall obedience. Ever since then, Yellowside has been just another region in the Amarian Empire. Its harbor is still an important trade center, but the money flows to Amaria. However, the islanders are nurturing an ever-growing hatred of their foreign rulers. Many of them want to break free of the Amarian yoke uh, whenever the opportunity arises. And whatever the coast and whatever the cost might be, in light of recent events such as when Amaria led two failed crusades against the western city-states in 1295 and 1298, and how the Amarian Empire has been weakened year after year, perhaps that opportunity is not too far into the future. Okay, the first book is hidden in this town in the southeast. You can pick it up right at the start or come back to it later. Let's see if we can get our heroes over to it. There we are, book one of five. Mysterious Journal Part 1. So these are the entries in the journal from the cutscene from the last scenario. Entry 1. I have no idea of where I am, no recollection of how I got here, nor any memory of where I came of where I come from. Even my own name is unknown to me. All I know for certain is that I am in an uninhabited location, or should I say, no longer inhabited. I have been here for approximately 40 days. I don't know exactly how long, because I didn't count the days at first. It seems like I am somehow gradually unlocking skills that have been hidden from me in my memory. I'm not learning to hunt or create tools. I'm dusting off old memories, or so I presume. For one thing, it was not until this morning that I had remembered... For one thing, it was not until this morning that I remembered how to write, and found any use for this journal. I hope that one day I might unlock the memories of who I am 
and what I'm doing here. Entry 2. The third day since I started counting the days, and approximately the 42nd day since I first woke up. I should recount my first days here, if nothing else than to have something to go back to if I lose my memory again. I woke up in a large cave, shivering and confused with a tremendous headache. I must have lay there for several days, passing in and out of consciousness as my headaches gradually faded, because the light changed from day to night every time I woke. Then, after perhaps a week in this state, I finally woke up, sat up, and had a look around. This moment is what I refer to when I say, the day I woke up. I spent the first few days just exploring the area around the cave, scavenging the grasslands for anything to eat. I had no knowledge at the time of what was edible or not, so I gathered almost everything I could find and dragged it back to the cave. After an hour's excursion at midday, I was exhausted, and I slept to the next morning. When I woke up again, I realized that many of the berries I had gathered were poisonous, and so I began sorting out the edible ones. I was startled by the fact that I hadn't known this just the day before. Somehow, that memory had unlocked in my mind during the night. As the days went on, I began to unlock more and more memories. On the fourth night, I remembered how to light a fire. On the seventh night, I realized what the pointy thing in my belt was, a knife, and what it could be used for. On the seventeenth day, I remembered how to make a spear, should any wild animals decide to pop by. On the twenty-fifth day, I went out into the woods and carved myself a bow and some arrows, as if the art of crafting the two had just implanted itself into my memory from nowhere. This went on for forty days, until the day I rediscovered how to write, and read what I had written. Entry 3. Today I decided to leave the cave. I am going to head west, towards the sunset. To the east there are mountains stretching from north to south as far as I can see, so west is the easiest route. There is a river nearby which appears to be going westward, and I intend to follow it downstream. Entry 4. It is a strange feeling, not knowing who you are. It is as if I was born, rather dramatically, just six weeks ago, in the cave where I first woke up. In the cave where I first wake up, born out of nothing, fully dressed, and fully grown. And yet I know that I have lived before. I do not know who I am, or who I was, but I know that my life did not begin in that cave. With my memories unlocking every other day, perhaps I will one day remember who I was when I went into that cave, why I went there, and what happened there. Until then, I will have to learn to survive in this place. Or, rather, relearn it. Entry 5. It would appear I have very nearly rounded the lake now. I am at a large river outflow, but on the opposite side of where I started. The mountains here are too steep for me to climb, so I shall be heading west again very soon. First, I intend to chop myself some wood, make a fire, and roast the giant boar that tried to attack me this morning. I found an axe and a stump around here, but I have been unable to find its owner or any other sign of human life. Still... This makes the first sign. Okay, the next book actually counts as all the little books you got from walking around the ruins at the start. So I'm not going to read that again. I read that in the video. So next I'll come over here for this book at the northwest part of the island. And this is going to be Mysterious Journal Part 2. Entry 6. Two weeks since I last wrote. I was going around the mountains at first, but then I found a deep green valley amongst them and decided to enter it. The valley soon got narrower, and after a few days it was merely a cart's width wide. Then, after a sharp corner, I came upon a village. The valley split into a gorge, and on each side of the gorge was a row of stone houses, all partially carved from the mountain itself. Several bridges connect the two sides with each other, and a few meters down the gorge is a rushing river, filled with jumping salmon. He would have liked that. The village was completely deserted, and many of the doors stood wide open. I suppose this could be the seasonal dwelling of some local tribe or other, but it seems unlikely. The living conditions right now are ideal, and no one who, and no one who intends to return would leave the place in such a state. So far, all the land seems to be deserted. I have found traces of human activity, the axe, a few abandoned huts and old campfires, and now this village but not a single living person. No dead people, either, for that matter. It would seem that I am completely alone here. Where the locals have gone, I cannot fathom. But they must all have left rather recently, 
The streets of the village are still whole and clean, and the vegetation has only just begun to reclaim the land. What has taken what has taken place here? An evacuation? Mass migration? I do not know, and it frightens me. I can only rule out cataclysmic natural disasters and plagues as there are no signs of death or destruction. While this may be a good thing for the non-casualties of said death and destruction, it only makes this place more eerie. Entry 7. I'm going back, out of the valley and into the open. Then I am going to continue to head west. I hope to be able to reach the sea that way. If I find salt water to the west, as I have found in the north and the south, I can only assume that I am indeed on an island, and, if that is the case, I must find some way of getting off it, and find some place where there is still human activity. Entry H. A rather curious thing happened today. I was fishing in a broad stream when a large jaguar came out of the foliage. As it rushed towards me, claws flashing, I stumbled to the ground. I had foolishly let me let my spear rest against a tree, and now I was unable to reach it. But as the jaguar got nearer, something flashed in my mind, a new memory, I suppose, unlocked itself, and my hands performed a strange and my hands performed a strange whip like motion in the cat's direction. From the tip of my fingers came a bolt of purple fire, and it hit the jaguar with a gentle explosion. The cat fell to the ground, more frightened than mortally wounded, and I could see the fear in its eyes. It looked at me for a split second, and then darted back into the foliage, quicker than it came out of it. Now, if I could unlock a few more skills like this, I should be a very happy man. Entry 9. This part of the land is nothing more than grassland. Tall grass, more tall, gla more tall grass, and the occasional hill. Not much to see, but plenty of hunting opportunities. Plenty of jaguars too, for that matter, but I'm getting quite good with this energy bolt magic. It's almost deadly now. Entry 10. I passed some rather extraordinary rock formations today. In the middle of the grassland were hundreds of enormous rock pillars, like the deformed remains of some monstrous ancient temple. I will be stopping here for a bit, before continuing my journey westward. After all, I am not exactly in a hurry. Entry 11. After traveling west for five days, I finally reached the ocean today. I found a large ship anchored at the shore, but there is no sign of the crew. There is still no sign of any other people, for that matter. I guess that it was with the ship that I came to this island, who knows how long ago. Entry 12. According to the ship's logs, the ship sailed east-southeast for uh, 29 days to get to the island. I will have to sail for at least as long in the opposite direction. Then, hopefully, I will be able to find out where I came from, and who I am, or who I was. And the next book comes from defeating the Lady of the Lake and taking the book from this island here. And she spoils it for us first, saying the guy dies at the end. Ha ha ha. Let's go read that book. I'm doing these a bit out of order, so it'll say a different number there. But this is The Tale of Sir Frederick. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there is a knight called Frederick the Magnificent, charming and all-around awe-inspiring junior, son of Hilda the barmaid and a stranger in the local bar, who embodied the qualities captured in the name of the child he left in Hilda's stomach. Frederick, however, grew up to possess none of the qualities embedded in his full name. He was meager, his posture was slightly bent, and all he inspired others to do was to tease and mock him. Frederick was, however, a true dreamer, a man of grand visions, visions he was certain he would never be able to fulfill. He dreamt of becoming a knight, of serving the local lord, winning his daughter's hand in marriage after some tremendous ordeal which he would carry out without breaking a sweat, and then building a castle of his own for him and his lovely bride. One rainy day, the goddess of fortune smiled upon Frederick from between the grey clouds. When Frederick was bringing a cow home through the village street, a cow that had escaped that same morning and got stuck in a pile of mud, he stumbled upon the lord of the castle sitting in a horse-drawn cart whose horses were nowhere to be found. He walked up to the cart and bowed so deeply that he ran his face into the muddy ground. He then promptly ran off, dried his face as best he could, and then returned to the cart, bowing more slowly this time. "'Who are you?' the lord roared. I am Frederick, my, war my lord, answered Frederick. Well, Freddy, don't just stand there like a bloody buffoon. Get me out of here, said the lord. 
Frederick did as he was told, and tied the cow and himself to the cart and began pushing. Soon the cart was rolling down the muddy street, and after only a minor ordeal, they reached the gates of the lord's castle. The gates were rolled up, and Frederick and the cow pushed the cart into the paved yard of the castle. Frederick stared at the castle in awe. He had only ever seen the magnificent building from afar before. Then the lord's voice roared again. Stop the cart, you cretin, for Frederick had entirely forgotten to stop running, and so the cart, the cow, the lord, and Frederick all slammed right into, into the wall of the castle. The cow gave out an ascending moo of pain, got loose, and promptly ran off again. The lord gave out a similar cry of pain from inside the cart. Frederick got to his feet and ran up to the broken cart, trying to pry open the wooden door, but it was no use. The door had broken and jammed shut. Father, cried a, fe cried a female voice from the door next from the door to the castle. Frederick turned, and what he saw was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen, and would ever see in his life. Towards him came running the princess of the castle, her voluptuous forms doing their best to break the laws of physics. The voluptuous forms came closer and closer, and then ran right past him, as did the body they were attached to. Young man, help me out here, cried the fair princess, standing by the cart. Blub ugh, replied Frederick. Then he came to his senses, took hold of the door of the cart again, and, with a strength he n never knew he had, pulled it straight off the cart. The door flew backwards, and so did he, holding it. Straight into the mud he fell, but he quickly got to his feet and began wiping the mud off. All things considered, said the lord upon climbing out of the cart, I think I can forgive you for breaking my cart. I was going to get a new one anyway. And besides, you did get me home in one piece, more or less, so what do you say? Do you want to be a squire here at the castle? I need more staff anyway. Frederick, quite enthusiastically, said yes, and shook the lord's hand, entirely forgetting his place and that his hand was quite drenched in mud. The lord screamed in, sh in shock, but the princess merely laughed at this. He felt embarrassed and a little bit afraid of being instantaneously decapitated by the lord, but the fair princess's laughter seemed to bring the lord to his senses. You will start your work in the pigsty, said the lord. Thank you, my lord, said Frederick, and bowed again. For two weeks, Frederick worked as hard as he could shoveling pig dung, particularly during those moments when the fair princess ventured near the pigsty, which is not often because she quite disliked the stench of the place. Still, she did pop in once or twice to check on him and laugh when one of the pigs pushed him into the mud and lay down to sleep on his back. Then, after two weeks, he was called into the stable master's quarters, was thoroughly scrubbed, shaved, perfumed, and clothed, and sent into the castle. He wondered what the lord might want of him, but, as he soon found out, the lord wanted nothing of him. He was not in the castle at all, but out on a small crusade to bring the neighboring town and their coffers to the true nuance of the true faith. As he reached the tower of the castle, where the stable master had sent him, he found the room lit with candles, decorated with lavish soft car carpets and colorful curtains. In the middle of the room was a large bed, upon which lay two voluptuous forms attached to the fair princess, who rose up, smiled at him, and invited him to her side. It would be highly inappropriate of me to describe the exercises of experimental physics that followed, but I will let you know that much merriness was experienced by everyone involved, except, of course, for the lord of the castle, who came home early from his campaign, angry as some other local lord had beaten him to spreading the good word in the neighboring town, and was disturbed by strange human noises from high in the castle. He caught the two youngsters in the midst of a particularly enjoyable experiment, and quickly decided he did not approve of such scientific experiments being performed in his house. Then he promptly took hold of Frederick and threw him out the window. Before Frederick landed on the ground, he had time to think two thoughts. First, that he would at least not die without fathering children, and second, Holy shit! This is it, isn't it? Oh my god, I don't want to go already. Please, dear lord, spare me. Oh, the ground is coming closer. What do I do? Ah! So ends the tale of poor Sir Frederick. His limbs and blood splattered across the, the courtyard of the castle, quickly mixed and muddled by the washing rain. He never had the chance of becoming the knight, and he died at the, very at the young age of 17. But wait, you might say, if he was never a knight, why call him Sir Frederick at all? Oh, because you see, he was called Sir Frederick, repeatedly even, although I must concede that only the fair princess ever called him Sir Frederick, but nevertheless, she did so with much conviction, enthusiasm, and other asms. And so died Sir Frederick, not entirely unhappy after all. The end. And the scenario's final book, right before the boss fight with Count Tangle, we go backwards and come up here to grab it. And of course, Emily's going to tell us, you're going back for a book when the fate of the world hangs on a thread? What's gotten into you? It better be a damn good book. I'm loading a save where, of course, the first time I had missed the most obvious book down there. But let's read this following one, or this final one. 
A short history of Diaspilea. Diaspilea, the city on the mountainside, is the 44th crown city in the kingdom, the first and so far only city to be built on Calpuria. Like most crown cities, it was built in a short matter of time, a mere three months, with direct help from Atheline himself. He used his powers to erect the walls of the city and to create the enormous mound upon which the palace now stands. While the city is modeled after traditional cities, with lower areas reserved for the common craftsmen, merchants, and workers of the land, and upper parts reserved for the clergy and military, it is still an odd bird among the crown cities. After the island of Calpuria was discovered in year 873 of Atheline's rule, it took no more than 60 years before construction of the city had begun. At this time, the island as a whole had merely 15,000 inhabitants, of which the majority lived in small trading posts along the western shoreline. The location reserved for the city was so far uninhabited and only visited a few times before by explorers. And yet, plans were being made for the construction of the city, something which would normally only happen when a city of at least 40,000 requested permission to become a crown city from Atheline. Atheline himself is said to have been a driving force behind the early construction of the city. As he has never openly explained why this is, one can only speculate. Perhaps he likes... Perhaps he, like so many of the colonists, saw Calpuria as virgin land for the kingdom and wanted to hasten the incorporation of this, beautiful, of this beautiful realm into his kingdom. Or perhaps he wanted a base for his own explorations on the island. After all, one can only imagine the intrigue he must have been filled with when a ragged band of explorers came into his throne room, claiming to know of a new world that not even the god king himself was aware of. Whatever the reason behind it, Dias Pelea was constructed in a short matter of time, and people from all over the kingdom flocked to the city, flocked to the new city. Currently the smallest of the crown cities and already filled to the brim, Dias Pelea is now home to 20,000 people. Many have come of their free volition, and many have been commandeered to populate the city and work the fields that surround it. If the city is to not become overpopulated, many will have to leave it in the years to come and spread out across the island. Dias Pelea, Pelea has a weakness that is unique among the crown cities. It is, utter, it is utterly dependent on shipments of food from the mainland. Because the city was built in such a hurry, no natural chain of trade has been established on the island itself, and the crown is temporarily supporting the city with massive transports of food. The soil is rich, but different from the soil on the mainland, and many crops that people are used to simply do not grow in this warmer climate. The people will therefore have to find new resources that they can trade for their beloved potatoes and pumpkins, or simply get used to a new diet. So in this final scenario, the first book is after the first Dark Guardian fight, you just go north, and we pick up this book. It is The Art of Magic Volume 2. As we learned in the previous short volume, there is, to be perfectly blunt, nothing magical about magic. Magic is purely and solely, a force of will. What separates the common strong-willed man from the powerful magician is his ability to affect the outside world through will alone, a great gift granted, like any other, to only a small number of people. However, while this gift is one you were born with, very few who, ha who have it ever learn to master it, just like very few people ever fully master their will. Like the everyman, most of the people with these gifts are left to follow with the currents of emotion, impulse, instinct, and social pressure, rather than their own minds. Those few who do succeed do so only after many years of self-taming, of conquering and reining in one's own emotions and impulses. Furthermore, only a handful of those who do master their will manage to sustain this mastery throughout their lives. Many lose it as they reach a higher age and some are only masters of their selves for short moments in time. There is, as far as we know, but one person in the history of humanity who has mastered his will to such an extent that he can truly be spoken of as a master of his self. This sole master is a legendary god-king of the Old Kingdom, Atheline. Many historians know very little about Atheline that can be verified, as rather few records survive from the Old Kingdom. There are, however, many transcripts of oral stories from throughout the realm of the ancient kingdom, written shortly after the fall, the Day of Raining Rocks. These, and a multitude of legends, make up the image we have of the great founder, leader, and demi-deity of the kingdom.
Atheline was born into a wealthy family, roughly 3,000 years ago. Due to his family's great wealth, Atheline spent his childhood in schooling with some of the greatest minds of his time. Having discovered his talent for magic at an early age, he spent many long hours every day practicing his skills, with the help of his tutors. While most boys his age were working in the field, out hunting small game, or working as apprentices, Atheline was mastering the powers of his will, outperforming his tutors, according to the stories, at the tender age of seven. Leaving home at age 13, Atheline traveled the world in search of even more knowledgeable magicians who might be able to help him further develop his skills. Through many years of expeditions and taking on the magical traditions of other cultures, Atheline slowly realized that there, that there were no such masters. He was already the most powerful magician in the world, and if he wanted to hone his skills even further, he would have to explore the path to mastery on his own. After a 15-year absence, much of which was spent in complete solitude on the desolate steppes to the far southwest, Atheline returned to the quarreling city-states and the land that would soon become the Old Kingdom. He became a recognized master of the magic arts in his native town of Zaliki, and he later became a unifying figure for the people of the various cities, as bloody wars raged between their leaders. Together with a few skilled military commanders, Atheline led a Union militia composed of ordinary men from all of the cities that joined him, all of those who yearned for a lasting peace, rather than more power for their respective king or chieftain. He led the militia into battle against greater, better trained armies, using his immense magical powers to rain hellfire on the enemy from afar. Securing one city-state at a time, Atheline and his allies managed to forge a new nation, one of brethren cities united under the rule of a single council of which Atheline was the most prominent figure. Because of Atheline's utter mastery of his self, he was able to postpone the very aging of his body. Fifty years after the end of the war, Atheline was the last remaining member of the ruling council, and thus the lone ruler of the realm. To secure his throne, and to ensure that no one else attempted to claim a place in his council or break the peace, Atheline retitled himself as king. Most people, however, soon began to see him as a god, or at the very least, a demigod. Thus, we see that through constant practice, Atheline managed to will himself away from death itself. He, he postponed his own death and effectively gained immortality. It is important to note, however, that not even a magician like Atheline can realistically be described as an immortal or all-powerful like any other man. Like any other man, Atheline would take damage from blows and weapons, even though he might, through his will, be able to heal any damage he had taken much faster than an ordinary man. Keeping death at bay also took a tremendous mental effort, every minute of the day, and more of an effort the older he became. This, I believe, is why most of the tales of Atheline's great achievements, paving the streets of gold, constructing entire cities out of thin air, or turning the ground beneath an enemy army upside down, all occurred, if they ever occurred, early in Atheline's life, because staying alive took more and more of an effort as he got older. Atheline would have less and less willpower to spend on other feats of magic. That is why the majority of his reign, reign was characterized not by the wonders of magic, but by the wonders of science and technology, which both flourished during his thousand-year reign of peace. Atheline probably hoped to be able to sublimate the process of fending off death, so that he would do so automatically, the same way one doesn't consciously control one's breathing. As far as we know, however, he never succeeded. Perhaps this task was too great, even for the greatest master himself? Or perhaps he needed more time? more time than the millennium he spent in the world. In the next short volume, we will take a look at more practical tips, what you can learn from the techniques Athelene and other great magicians used, and how you can begin coding your own mastery of your will. The second book is at the bottom of these here stairs, and just like the other scenarios, I'll grab these one at a time so it's clearer where they are in the objectives menu. And the second book is The Other Side. Among the educated men of all fields, theologians are quite likely the luckiest when it comes to studying the Old Kingdom. When the kingdom was vanquished during the Day of Raining Rocks, the vast majority of its population, its cities, towns, and settlements, its history, went under in a flash. While some remains survived, concentrated on the edges of the kingdom's borders, the systems of belief that dominated the Old Kingdom survived largely unharmed, although the numbers of believers dwindled down to the thousands following the fall. How then could the religious texts survive this monumental disaster? 
For that, we owe thanks to a handful of passionate missionaries scattered in the wild lands beyond the Old Kingdom, who had gone there to spread the to spread the far to the barbarian peoples. Uh, who had gone there to spread the religions far to the barbarian peoples? I guess there's a missing word there. Uh, they were, so far as we can tell, compassionate people wanting to educate the barbarians before the ever-expanding realm of the Old Kingdom reached them and conquered them. The conquest of barbarian tribes was, as is key to understanding the Old Faith, the rule and dictate of the religion. As far as modern theologians and historians have been able to find, the religion of the Old Kingdom never had a single name. In fact, the core of the religion was very different from the religions we know today. One of the most central differences is the issue of faith. In our supreme belief system, faith in the goodwill of God is the core of everything, the basis of all doctrine and teachings, and the most important motivator for leading a good life in private. In the old religion, which I will henceforth refer to as constructionism, for reasons which will become obvious further into this text, faith was merely the refuge of last resort. The people of the Old Kingdom did not believe in God as a patron of all mankind in the same way we do, while we, save for some fringe, deviant groups, believe that God has given us the task of leading morally good and sound lives, and that he will reward us if we meet his demands, the God of the Old Kingdom was no father of the people. They did, in fact, not even call him God, but rather the Maker. In their minds, he was not even a he, but an it, a being beyond our most vivid imaginations that bore no resemblance to its human or other creatures. According to the, script to the scriptures, the Maker had created the world over the course of eight millennia, carefully crafting each species, each mountain range and lake, to be, its, to be to its liking. Once it was done, it breathed life into the world. While all living things, when all living things had woken up, time had been set into motion through this breath of life, and the Maker saw that the world was fully functioning. It went to sleep, only to wake up again when its breath of life had been exhausted and all activity ceased. This is a very common, yet to us rather strange, simile that frequently occurs in the scriptures. The maker is likened to a watchmaker. Like the watchmaker, it carefully assembles the watch, down to the tiniest piece, and protects the actual clockwork under several protective outer layers. Then he winds up the watch, and leaves it to itself until it needs another winding. It would seem that there were watched in the old king kingdom of a different, likely superior construction than in our days. Oh, see... It seems that there were watches in the Old Kingdom of a different, likely superior construction than in our days, relying closely on sealed mechanics rather than weights and pendulums or the sun to count time. Perhaps our understanding of the beliefs of the Old Kingdom would be far greater or at least deeper should we be able to reconstruct such mechanics. The implications of this belief in a mechanical construction of the world cannot be understated. It underlies the entire philosophy of life and governance in the kingdom. From the single man at the bottom to the kingdom as a whole at the top, every entity was a piece of the world system. The duty of each individual, and of the entire nation, was to become as productive and technically advanced as possible so as to not squander the breath of life inserted into the world by the Maker, and so that it might be pleased with its creation's accomplishments and decide to once more breathe life into it. This imperative for technological advancement cannot, however, be separated from the social imperative imperative of continuous moral self-government, a notion sprung from the same belief in taking full advantage of the breath of life. The individual should strive always to be his best, always courteous, righteous, honest, and always trying to mirror the code of morals in his actions. Each individual should also pass these values down to their own children, along with a curiosity and appreciation for the technological and theological sciences. With a present-day mindset, we would likely see these imperatives as two separate realms of majesty, technology and science as being the study of the makings of God, and theology and moral teachings as the studies of the nature and will of God. For the people of these times, however, there was no such distinction. Because their God, the Maker, was by definition absent from the world, and alien to any of its life forms, studying the nature of this God would be utterly meaningless, except through studying his creation. Through careful studies of the worlds of physics, biology, and geology, mankind would be able to see the full extent of the Maker's power and ingenuity, manifested in the complexity and chaotic rationale of its creation. Then, once man had understood the building blocks around it, 
it would be able to utilize them to the fullest in building a civilization for itself, the way the Maker had intended when it wrote the laws of the world. The notion that lay behind the techno-social social imperative, as it was called, was that the world, and by extension human nature, was not a finished work. The world, and the skills and characters of every individual, was merely the soil in which humanity was to grow into a far greater state. The wild world in which the kingdom was situated was to be tamed and organized. While the people of the kingdom cultivated their moral character, the barbarian peoples of the world should be brought under the, under the kingdom's reins, so that they may contribute to the techno-social development of the world as well. Of course, as in any time period, the contributions of barbarian peoples often took the shape of forced labor, but actually to a lesser extent than in many present-day conflicts. Perhaps the most astonishing aspect of this mentality was that it, by and large, was accepted and practiced by most, if not all, layers of society. It was by no means a poor man's religion, nor was it a belief only for the upper classes. Normally, while the richer groups of most societies often adhere to some form of higher philosophy, the commoner, the small-scale farmer and villager, have no time or need for higher thinking as the days consist of constant arduous labor, at the end of which they want easy pleasure and entertainment, rather than spending time cultivating the moral character. If a higher moral character is to flourish among the commoners, it is usually necessary to impose it from above. However, the old kingdom possessed, at least according to legend, one thing that no other country has ever had. They were not ruled by a succession of more or less competent kings, who all reigned based on trial and error in their relationships with the people, but by an eternal king whose rule spanned a millennia, a focal point and centerpiece of life in the kingdom. Generation after generation, they were ruled by the legendary wizard king Atheline. Many theologians and historians speculate that the religious and philosophical writings from these days all originate, directly or indirectly, from Athelene himself. As is believed, Athelene was an old, educated man by the time he sat down on the throne. He strongly believed in the existence of a supernatural creator of the world, just as most scholars of his time. What he managed to do was to create a philosophical framework applicable to all sectors of society and areas of life that could be slowly introduced and passed down into the population, improved and expanded generation after generation, all through his personal guidance. After a few generations, the techno-social imperative, the cornerstone of the philosophy, would be a natural part of every man's thinking, a constant balancing factor to the strong powers of in of instinct, desire, and leisureliness. The implementation of this was made easier by the fact that Athelene himself had fully mastered his body and mind, living solely by his own imperative, to the extent that he had even conquered death and externalized his will into the form of magical power. He was a constant living reminder of the importance of the techno-social imperative. The common people, thus, looked to him as either a role model or as the closest thing to a god there was in the world. Athelene thus formed the core of the Old Kingdom, and his personal philosophy slowly grew into the faith of the people and, to some extent, the law of the land. Athelene was not only the protector of the land, but the leader of the cause, the one constant in an ever-changing, ever-developing world, a continuity that anchored the highly developed country in its simple roots and led it towards a paradisical, fu a, a paradisical future, an unbroken royal lineage in and of himself. Athelene also filled a role in the constructionist belief that he may not have originally intended to, or, some would say, was his only true intention. Because the Maker was an ever-absent deity, and Athelene was the vessel through which the world would reach techno-social perfection, Athelene in the minds of the masses became God himself. And much as he tried to separate himself from godhood in his teachings and dictates, a majority of the masses still found it convenient to call God the one man who was immortal, could bend and create matter and primitive life forms out of thin air, and who reprimand, reprimanded them, and who reprimanded them for not following the moral code. This is likely why the this is likely why the exclamation "By Athelene" survives to this day, an expression in which most cultures would substitute his name for that of a deity. There is a lot left to learn about the fair and philosophy of the old kingdom. But by simply studying the scriptures and notebooks of the ancient missionaries, we might be able to, print, to paint a vague picture of the broader image. 
As long as research continues to be made about the Old Kingdom, we will likely discover more about the religious life and dogma that existed in those days. And the third book is here right after the Scorpion fight with the Dark Guardians. And this one doesn't have a title, so I'm wondering if there's some parts of this book that is missing. But let's just go. A second theory, more. I think this is about the theories of what's behind the barrier. A second theory, more consistent with the current theological research, is that the barrier is the border between our world and the abode of the Maker. This is the theory presented, proposed by Professor Dofarga, a theologian from the school of Anogari. According to some interpretations of the scriptures, of the scriptures, he says, the Maker created the world literally around itself, and then went to sleep only to wake up again when time had grinded to a halt, leaving the world to itself until then. The barrier, then, might be the invisible wall surrounding its abode, making eastern Calpuria the center of the world. One fact that appears to be in his favor is that the barrier indeed has an observed curvature, signifying that it might in fact be circular, shielding off a central area from the rest of the world. The third theory is that the barrier is nothing more than a natural phenomenon, whose mechanics we yet have no tools or facts to describe. Perhaps it is a shield set up by a powerful forgotten wiz wizard from ancient times, or perhaps nothing more than a defense system belonging to an ancient civilization older and greater than ours on the other side. Of course, even the most down-to-earth theories have fascinating implications. What if there are other advanced civilizations to the east? Are we perhaps not alone in this world? Not counting the barbarians in the outskirts of our continent? And do we really wish to make contact with a civilization whose defense systems are far beyond our comprehension? One can only look at the way the primitive barbarian tribes have fallen to our advanced civilization. Why should we not face a similar fate if the roles were reversed, if we were the ones to come into contact with a more techno, techno socially advanced civilization? All of this, of course, is so far mere speculation. We shall need decades or more of intense studies and experiments to determine the nature of this barrier and how, and if, one might be able to cross it. All right, so this last book happens while we are running away. Come on, come on, come on. Don't let the rocks hit you. So we head down this passageway here. Pay attention, because it's going to be a bit of an explosion. Don't come forward. And boom, there's the book. And we get a little chat message here from Atheline. I thought you might find this interesting if you live long enough to read it. And it is The Mysterious Journal, Part 3. Entry 13,198. While pinpointing the first two relics, the Relic of the Moon and the Relic of the Sun, took a painstaking time, the last relic, the Relic of the Rock, has more or less revealed itself. I've been told that it has been discovered by a Gwindian warlord, and that it was used in the final moments of the Gwindo's Ocean War. News travels slowly to this part of the world, however, the Atlians care little about what goes on in the east, and consequently they get to know little of it. And it will take me many months to get to Gwindelgard. I only hope that the Gwindians do not realize what a powerful artifact they hold in their hands. According to what I hear, all they managed to do with it was create a muddy land bridge across a lake to a castle. If someone with actual magical powers were to get their hands on it, they could have turned that lake upside down and made a mountain out of it. Entry 13,199 I was just two miles shy of the Zoshan border when the latest news on the relics reached me. It turns out the magician Zephyra escaped her clutches and got her hands on the Relic of the Rock. I suspect then that she is traveling northwest to Kior to get her hands on the Relic of the Sun before the Gwindians have a chance to react. I may as yet be too late, but there is a chance that I can intercept her in the Underworld. If she is smart, she will be traveling through there to divert all attention away from her escapades, and to come directly to the location of the third relic, Yellowside. Finally, it appears that something of importance is happening in the world. Entry 13,200. Alas, there was nothing I could do to stop her. She appears to be more powerful than I thought, and even if I managed to take her out, her guards and her henchmen would likely kill me before I could destroy the relics. My best hope now is to join ranks with the Gwindian that is following her. If I must, I will go out into the darkness and find them myself. Hopefully, with our skills and means combined, we shall be able to track her down. 
Then, at long last, after 1800 years, I will finally be able to destroy my most dangerous creations. And that is the end of the book reading marathon. But there is a sequel to The Relics of Athelene that is in the works, The Shadows of Calpuria. So that will come out uh, at some point in the future, hopefully. And when that comes out, I do plan on playing through it. So thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>